So last Sunday, last Sunday we talked about, and I'm not going to be long, but I got to give you this because this is going to equip you for the week. Your praise has set you up to receive what God is getting ready to download into your spirit for the week. Last week we talked about walking in your divine assignment. And I want to let you know that God created you for a divine assignment, a purpose. You have a reason for existing. You are not here because God was bored and he had nothing to do. And he said, well, I guess I'll make me some people to play with. (laughs) You're not God's toy. You were created on purpose for a purpose. And I don't care how you got here. God expected you and God created you. I don't care what the surrounding circumstances were. In fact, the Holy Ghost is telling me to tell you, whatever you do, do not regret your birth. Do not regret the circumstances surrounding your birth. I don't care if your mom or your dad did not plan for you. You were part of God's divine plan. Everybody cannot be born in perfect scenarios and perfect situations because we have a world full of unperfect people that need Jesus and imperfect people who need Jesus. Imperfect people can only see Jesus when they come into contact with other imperfect people who have received Jesus. If my background was perfect, how could I identify with somebody who feels like their background was not perfect? If my mom and dad just met each other, started dating, got married, and five years into the marriage had me, how could I ever identify with somebody whose mom got pregnant and was left out in the cold? Hmm, God help me here. And God says, I allow different scenarios to bring you into this world because I have a specific purpose and a destiny that your birth and the situation surrounding your birth qualify you for. See, there are people who will look at you and think you ain't never been through nothing because of how good God has cleaned you up. But when they discover your story, they then know that we serve a God who can take imperfect people and imperfect situations and make them look like they ain't never been through nothing. Stop regretting the fact that you ever had a terrible addiction. It's your terrible addiction that now qualifies you to go and talk to somebody who's currently struggling with a terrible addiction. Because you will be able to tell them not what you heard, but what you know. You'll be able to tell them if God did it for me, then I know he can do it for you. Oh, I hear the Holy Ghost. Don't think it's coincidence and don't be caught off guard when you run into somebody who's struggling with the same thing you just survived. And God says, I want you to look at them. I want you to tell them you are me and I am you. And I'm telling you from what I know, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I would have been messed up a long time ago. Don't regret how you got here. Don't despise how you got here. You were supposed to get here the way you got here to reach the people God is calling you to. I know what it feels like to have low self-esteem. I know what it feels like to be insecure. I know what it feels like to be rejected. That is supposed to be part of your testimony. Mm. But thank God you no longer have to walk in fear of rejection. Thank God you no longer have to feel insecure. See, the thing about the devil is he was hoping you would stay in your past. Because if you stayed in your past, you miss your divine assignment. But thank God that he walks with you every step of the way and he brought you out of your past. And the thing I love about God is that you can be in the fire and still don't smell like smoke. The devil wants to keep you from getting in your divine assignment. But you have a divine assignment. So last week, as we talked about embracing and walking in your divine assignment, we had three questions. Number one, how do you recognize your divine assignment? Well, your divine assignment is the thing that you are emotionally connected to, spiritually connected to, mentally connected to. You know it's your divine assignment when you can't stop thinking about it, can't stop praying about it, 
Step, can't stop getting emotional about it. Let me go a step further. How do you know what you're called to? You are called to the very thing that makes you upset when it's done wrong. You want to know why it bothers you so much? Because you're part of the solution. And so until it's so, I could not stand when people would bore people with church. Don't bore me with God. Don't bore me with church. There's a lot of things to bore people with. Don't use church to do it. So I would sit there upset, no connection, sit there not finding my identity. And God spoke to me when I was 14 years old and said, you want to know why you get so upset when church and worshiping and praising me is misused and abused and done wrong? It's because I've called you later on in life to be part of the solution. So I knew at 14 years old, I was called to pastor a church. My grandfather actually laid hands on me, and in the service that he laid hands on me, he called it out that at 14, I would one day pastor a church. There's a lot of things I did before, because God will anoint you even before he appoints you. I'm ask David. David was anointed king before he was appointed king. So a lot of things I did before I started pastoring. One of the things I did, I worked at Sony Studios. I was a sound engineer, a sound editor at Sony Studios. Would you believe that while I was a sound editor at Sony Studios, your amazing co-pastor was the assistant to the international president, the president of international distribution for all of the movies for Warner Brothers? We had us some amazing jobs, some amazing careers. There's an interesting statistic out there that says most pastors don't know what they would do if they weren't pastoring. That's not our story. We know exactly what we'd be doing. I know exactly. I'd be in a category what you call a Y1. It's a sound mixer, sound engineers, top in the Editor's Guild, the union. I'd be doing that at Sony Studios right about now. She'd probably be the president of international distribution at Warner Brothers right now. But that was just a means to an end. We just did that so we can make sure we have good media in the church that God has called us to pastor. You know what I'm saying? God has a way of connecting everything. And so we just did that, but our ultimate destiny, our ultimate calling was to pastor church. So don't think that your process is not part of your ultimate destiny. Don't ever judge your whole book by the chapter you're currently on. So we talked about the thing that you're called to do. It's that emotional connection. It's that spiritual connection. It's that mental connection. Then the question became, after I recognize my divine assignment, how do I respond to my divine assignment? You can't miss this. I'm setting you up for success in the spirit realm. The first thing you do when you recognize your divine assignment, your first response is prayer. You stop and pray. Now, let me give you the formula or remind you of the formula for prayer. It is ACTS, A-C-T-S, ACTS, A-C-T-S. That A stands for adoration. Adoration. When you pray, don't just rush in telling God to do a bunch of stuff for you. Nobody wants to be in that kind of relationship. Don't just rush in talking about God do this, God do that, God do this. God says, how much do you love me? Can you tell me what I mean to you first? So when you start your prayer, start telling him, God, you're an amazing God. You're an awesome God. You're a mighty God. I thank God that we don't vote in a new God every four years, but you're just God all by yourself. You're God eternal. In the beginning, God. That means before you even formed the earth, before I got here, God. And after I'm gone, you'll still be God. There'll never be a time where you were not God and you will not be God. You are God and God all by yourself. Then you go to C. That C stands for confession. If there's anything in me that's not like you, free me of it, deliver me from it, forgive me of it, and don't let it linger inside of me because I don't need any blockage from hearing your voice. I don't need any blockage from seeing your hand and falling, falling, following, following in your footsteps. I don't need anything from keeping me from being what you created me to be. And everybody has something that they need God to forgive them of. If you say I ain't got nothing, you need God to forgive you for being a liar. Then after confession, you go to tea. That's Thanksgiving. Father, I thank you for everything you've already done, for everything you're currently doing, for everything you're getting ready to do. So you're setting the atmosphere. Start thanking him. And then that S is supplication. That's your prayer request. Now that you've set the atmosphere, now that you've laid the foundation, my wife knows she can get anything out of me when she tells me how wonderful I am. I've never been so excited to take out the trash. As I am after she does, after she gets done saying, you're so awesome. You're so amazing. You know the trash is coming tomorrow. You ain't never seen nobody take out no trash. Watch how I take out the trash. I'm a trash taker out her master. <laughs> excited to wash dishes. Excited to do anything because the atmosphere has been set. It's not just me. Everybody loves when they feel appreciated. Everybody loves when you know that somebody really honors you for you and not what you can do for them. 
It's the same with God. God wants to know, are you just in relationship with me because of what I can do for you? Are you in relationship with me because you're scared of me? Because you think if you're not in relationship with me, I'm sending you to hell, and so now you're scared to not be in relationship with me? That's not the kind of relationship I want with you. I want a relationship where you love me just for being who I am. That's the reason why you can tell somebody who really loves God, because they praise him even after they get laid off. They will praise him with no money in the bank. They will praise him when people walk away from them. They really live this thing that says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. So when I'm down to nothing, I still got a praise. When they talk about me, I still have a praise. And so your prayer flow is to adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Then the question becomes, how do you relate to your divine assignment? You gather information but you can, because you cannot be effective in anything you don't know about. So you have to gather information. Now that I know what I'm called to do, what does what I'm called to do entail? What what does that encompass? So you gather information, you go into intercession. You pray in all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. Don't ever do another thing without praying first. I don't even eat a bag of Doritos without praying over them. I haven't seen people choke over a Cheeto before. So I pray over everything. Pray without ceasing. Men should always pray. Don't do anything without praying. So you gather information, you go into intercession, and then you give intention. What is your plan? Plan your work and work your plan. Now I just want to comb through chapter 2, if you don't mind, for the next, I don't know, 10 to 60 minutes. I just want to comb through chapter 2 just for, just for, I won't be here that long. Just comb through chapter 2 for a little bit. And I want to title this one, if you'd be so kind to let me title it. I want to, I want to title this one, How to Start the Building Process. You want to build something in your life. How do you do it? You want to build something great for God. And I can tell you, if God's hand is on it, it's going to happen. If God's hand is on it, you're going to build it. You want to build something great. You want to leave an inheritance and a legacy for your children and your children's children and your children's children's children. I saw the craziest vision I've ever seen and I almost want to say it was a, something I, I might have saw this. I might have seen this at Disneyland. Sure. I saw it somewhere. I saw the craziest. I had the craziest vision the other day. And it was blocks, it was blocks in the walkway leading up to our ultimate building. And all of the blocks in the, run, in the walkway had the names of every individual who did anything to have the church built. It was every name, and God showed me thousands of names. I saw Susan Anderson. I saw Fred Johnson. I I don't even know if these are real people, but these are the names that I saw. I saw names that said the Hope family, the Jones family. And as I saw the names, I just saw that everybody in that concrete walkway, these were all the people who band together, put their resources together, and built Hope City. So now that our children and our children's children could walk and find the names of their ancestors, of those who came before them. And I saw children of ours bringing their children and saying, you see this name here, Hank Williams? That's your grandfather. Your grandfather helped get this church built, get this city built. That's your grandmother. That's your uncle. And I saw this vision of all of us banding together and building something great for God. So much so to where God spoke this to me. He said, this time when I do it, no one man will be able to take credit for any of it. God says, when I build my temple this time, it'll be a family effort. And all of us will be able to say, for the people had a mind to work. And because the people had a mind to work, look what the people have built for our Lord. It'll be a temple built unto God by the people of God. It won't be personality driven. It won't be individual driven. It'll be driven by the hand of God that rested on a congregation. Mm. And as God builds our church, he's going to build your house. God says, as he builds your house, I'm going to walk you through how I use Nehemiah to rebuild a city. And as I walk you through how I use Nehemiah to rebuild a city, I'm going to rebuild your career. I'm going to rebuild your family. 
I'm going to rebuild your hope and your joy. I'm going to rebuild your marriage. I'm going to rebuild my church, but I'm going to rebuild your soul too. I'm going to rebuild your spirit. By the end of this year, you'll have faith that you can't even explain. Your faith will be so charged up that you'll be saying things and people go, you crazy. You say death and life are in the power of my tongue. I can speak things into existence. I can speak a promotion into my life. I can speak money into my bank account. I can speak cancer off of my body. I can prophesy things into the atmosphere that weren't the case before I spoke it. But now that I spoke it, it's now the case. Because I serve a God, watch this, not a guy who, a God who doesn't lie. I serve a God who can't lie. Oh, God help me here. I don't serve a God who doesn't lie. I serve a God who can't lie. Huge difference. Huge difference. Because I don't lie, but I can. But we serve a God who can't lie. In other words, even if God says something and it wasn't that way before he said it, just because he said it, from now on, it's that way. If God says a green light means stop and a red light means go, even if it didn't mean that before he said it, because he can't lie, from now on, a green light means stop and a red light means go. God says, I'm giving you the power to speak things out of your mouth that even if it wasn't that way before you, before you said it, just because you're speaking things through my presence, It'll be that way because you said it. Because we serve a God that even if I say I'm cancer free and the doctor says there's cancer, I can say it one more time, I'm cancer free. And because I said it, the cancer will leave. God says, you're going to speak ridiculous things. Stuff like... They're going to give us land to build on. (laughs) Stuff like, not only will they give us land to build the temple of God on, but then they'll turn around and ask, can they rent some of it from us? (laughs) So now you want to pay me to use what you gave me. (laughs) They'll stop talking about 1906, Azusa Street. They'll stop talking about Catherine Kuhlman. They'll stop talking about Amy Simple McPherson. They'll stop talking about Charles Harrison Mason. They'll start talking about a family that got together in Aurora, Colorado and had the nerve to name their family Hope City and begin to speak life where there was only death. Watch what the Bible says, Nehemiah chapter 2. Oh, I hope you can hear the word of the Lord this morning. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of the king of Texas, when wine was before him, you done woke up now, that I took the wine, wait a minute, what? And gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. I don't want you to miss it, because sometimes when we read too fast, we read over some of the most important words. He starts out by saying, it came to pass in the month of Nisan. Now, in chapter one, he says, I got word in the month of Keslef. The month of Keslef in chapter one, just the chapter just before this, the month of Keslef in chapter one would be our November or December. The month of Nisan in chapter two, just the next chapter over, the month of Nisan would be our late March or April. So four months has passed. Between chapter one and chapter two, four months has passed between the time Nehemiah got the word and then his first thing that he did about it. His first conversation based on the word that he got in Nehemiah chapter one is four months later. And here's what God is saying to you. God says, whatever you do, take your time to process. It is a trick of the enemy to get you to jump into something right now. Don't miss what I'm about to say. We serve a God who moves 
immediately after the process. So what God is doing with us right now, we're in a season of immediately. But this season of immediately comes on the heels of a season of process. So people will look at us now and go, must be nice overnight. Must be nice how fast God is doing it. That's because they see the immediately, but they weren't there for the process. I've gone through a process to now enjoy his immediate. Hmm. It's the reason why they get you every time they have a sale. Because they're hoping you can't stomach a process, but you want to walk in the immediately. They get you every time. The Mother's Day weekend sale. You jumped all over it. There's going to be another one on Father's Day. I hate to tell you that. There's going to be another one on Father's Day. There's going to be another one for Memorial Day weekend. There's going to be another one for Labor Day. They're going to do the fall sale. They do the tax refund sale. Look at them trying to dig all into your tax refund money. They're going to do a kids going back to school sale. And they act like you got to get it right now. This jacket ain't going to be here tomorrow. You got to wear it now. They get you because they're hoping you don't understand the profit of being in the process. And Nehemiah, ooh, I hear God telling me to tell somebody, slow down. There's still more in the process. Oh, God, help me. Uh, God says, here's the prayer that I want you to pray. I want you to pray that I will show you your divine assignment in such a way that it becomes impossible for you to miss it. I serve a God who can put your assignment in your face and you can't miss it. We had just gotten married. 2001, we got married. We lived in this little community city called Marina Del Rey. We thought we was doing something. Think about it. Marina. Doesn't that sound like something? Marina Del, Del, ooh, Del, Del Rey. Ooh, you living somewhere? Just married, 2001. We lived in Marina Del. We had a one-bedroom apartment. 2001. That thing was $1,900 for one bedroom. That ain't nothing now. Well, it is something now, but I'm saying that back then, 2001, that was just too much money for anything. 2001? Dude, we just got into the 2000s. We're fresh out of 1999. We were driving to a city called Palmdale. Palmdale was about 50 miles north of Los Angeles Airport. Marina Del Rey was about five miles from Los Angeles Airport. We were driving to Palmdale. On the way to Palmdale, we look off to the left and we see a city with all these beautiful lights. We say, what city is that? We discover it's a city called Valencia. We say, ooh, we like Valencia. We think we want to move to Valencia. We drive through Valencia. It's nice. It's a perfect place to raise a family. I begin to pray. I said, God, if you want us to move to Valencia, show it to me so clear that it'd be impossible for me to miss it. I don't want to miss it. Don't want to miss it. I was working at Sony Studios down in Culver City. The Sony Studios was 35 miles north of Valencia, uh, south of Valencia. 35 miles south. 35 miles south is where I'm working. I'm sitting there at a light on my lunch break at a light, and I say, God, if you want me to move to Valencia, please make it so clear that it'd be impossible for me to miss it. I look up, and I see on a billboard, it says, come home to Valencia. <laughs> Got so excited. The next day, I drove back to that stoplight, flip phone, went to take a picture, and the billboard was gone. They didn't cover it up with a come home to Del Taco or something. That's, I ain't eaten Del Taco since. But it was in that moment, hear me good, that I could ask God, speak to me in a way that it'd be impossible for me to miss it. I learned to pay attention to the songs I'm listening to, to the conversations I'm having. I've learned to pay attention to the phone calls that I accept, to the people that I let in my house. That's the reason why you have to guard your atmosphere. Because I need God to be able to speak to me through my music. I need God to be able to speak to me through my relationships. So I can't have God speak to me through my relationships if I have ungodly people around me. Because how are they going to speak to me if he can't even speak to them? But God can speak to you through a commercial. God, do you want me to do it? Here comes a commercial by Nike. Just do it. And so after the process... He's an immediate God, but there is a process. 
Watch what he says. He says, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. Guys, don't miss what I'm about to say. You need some people around you that can recognize when you're not yourself. And they care enough to ask you about it. You need people around you who can say, I know you. You're not yourself today. You're not smiling and laughing the way you normally smile and laugh. What is wrong with you? And Nehemiah said, he asked me what was wrong with me because I'd never been sad before in his presence. So I became dreadfully afraid, afraid, respectful of him, mindful that I was in his presence. I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Don't miss what Nehemiah did. Immediately in that moment, Nehemiah connected his emotions to some conditions he said I'm sad because it benefits you when you can connect your emotions to a condition when you are sad and you don't know why you're sad that's from the devil You need to be able to say, I am sad because. Why, pastor? Because now that helps shape my prayers. And now I know what to pray over. I'm not praying over my sadness. I'm praying over the city that's making me sad. And many of us, you're just simply praying shallow prayers connected to your emotions. But if you knew what your emotions were connected to, you would bypass praying over your emotions and you would pray to what's driving your emotions. God, not don't make me sad, but God, fix the issues on my job. Not don't make me afraid, but God, heal my marriage. Why are you afraid? Why are you fearful? Why are you full of anxiety? Why are you sad? A healthy Christian can connect their emotions to a condition. Then the king said to me, what do you request? Hear me good, y'all. I'm going to be done soon. You need somebody around you who when they find out something's wrong with you, their next question is, how can I help you? You don't need anybody else around you who does not care that you're going through stuff. He says, I'm sad because of the condition of my home. The king does not say, well, Nehemiah, ain't nothing we can do about that. Listen, you ain't there. You here. You need to be present. This is your job. This is where you need. Bring your mind in, need. Bring your mind in. No, he says, if that makes you sad and I love you and I'm connected to you, how can I help you? Now watch this. When the day comes and God gives you such favor with people that they ask you, what can I do to help you? Don't respond immediately. The Bible says, Nehemiah, after he got that question, the next words are these three words. So I prayed. Acknowledge him in all your ways. I prophesy the day is coming where somebody's going to be able to do for you what you couldn't do for yourself. And they're going to ask you, what do you want me to do? Here's your response. Thus saith the Lord, this is your response. Let me pray about it and I'll get back to you. Because God says, if you respond in the moment, you'll respond in your emotions. But if you come back to my presence and we process together, you will respond what I've ordained for you. And you'll respond what I speak to you. So Nehemiah said, the king asked me, what do you want from me? When your employer asks you, how can we make this job better for you? Tell your employer, let me pray about it. Let me think about it. And I'll get back to you. He prayed about it. And then he says in verse five, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah to the city of my father's tombs that I may rebuild it. See, the thing I love about Nehemiah is he took a break. He took a break from talking to the king to talking to the king of kings. He says, before I respond to you, I got to talk to you. I know you got to talk to your boss, but I need to talk to the boss of my boss first. And then when he came back, he not only prayed, but he planned. See, prayer must be followed up with work. And his prayer was bold. His prayer was specific. His prayer was exactly what he needed. And that's what God wants to give you. He wants to give you an answer to a request that's bold, that's specific, that's needed. And then watch what the Bible says. And the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me. And I set him a time. If you don't remember anything else, remember what I'm about to say. Always have a time frame. Create 
a time frame. Hear me good, y'all. The reason why many of us never accomplish anything is because we never give ourselves a due date. And so you end every year and go into the next year with the same goals that you had that previous year. But because you didn't have a due date. Listen, what do you want to accomplish by December 2023? What do you want to see? That's your due date. December 31st, 2023. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is 2023. What do you want to accomplish by the end of this year? Because if you don't give yourself a due date, you'll go into 2024 talking about believing him for more. 2025, I'm going to stay alive. 2026, I'm going to get it fixed. 2027, more heaven. 2028, it ain't too late. 2029, I'm going to be just fine. 2030, I'm getting spiritually dirty. Stop it! What do you want to accomplish by the end of May? By the end of June? By the end of July, give yourself a due date. Then he says, furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. Listen, God says, I want you to take time this week and consider accessible resources during your journey. What, listen, who do you know right now that has access to something you don't have access to? Here's your prayer. Once you get that person's name, God, give me favor with them. Because if you give me favor with them, the resources will come. Nehemiah asked the king, write letters to the other kings and the governors. But there's one of them that has all the stuff I need. Write in that letter that he will give me access to his resources. Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost. God says, I'm getting ready to give you access to somebody else's resources. Something somebody else work hard for, I'm getting ready to give you favor with that. And you're going to say, I didn't even work for this. This was given to me. Because you see it read in the book of Nehemiah, you're going to say, God, the same favor you gave Nehemiah. See, let me tell you something. You have the vision, but you don't have all the tools. But if you walk in the vision, the tools will come. Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, then all these things shall be added unto you. Oh, I hope you're picking all this up. So then he says, then he says, and the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. The king gave me everything I asked for because I had favor. You got to show up in meetings expecting to walk away with everything you asked for. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king has sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. Let me tell you something. Ooh, give me five minutes. Let me tell you something. God always protects where God directs. God always provides where God guides. I didn't even ask for the army and the captains of the horsemen to come with me, but they came with me because God always makes sure I don't go by myself. And he encamps an army of angels around me. Even as I stand here and I preach, I can see the angels standing around the theater. I can see the angels on the stage. I see angels in the parking lot. If we really got out of ourselves and surrendered all to the glory of God in this theater, we would not even recognize time passing. If we really came to church going, it's all of you, God. I am completely opening myself up to your glory You'll be wondering how you even got on the floor. The glory of the Lord. And then watch what the Bible says in verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, I ain't going to talk too much about them today, but they get on my nerves. They're going to get on yours too. Because they're the only kind of people who show up just to try to talk you out of your purpose. They try to stay close to them just to ridicule them. You got some people whose sole assignment in your life is to try to ruin your life. Mm. Come on. Lord, help me say it. There are some people in your life right now who only want to know your business to use your business against you. They are in your circle, but not in your corner. There are some people right now that they will try to ridicule you and talk. You want to know why? Because misery loves company. You can't help getting the invite but you can't help accepting the invitation. 
And you got to make up in your mind that discernment is what matters most. Because just because somebody says, I'm praying for you, doesn't mean they're really praying for you. In fact, there are people who will inbox you and text you and call you and they'll say, I'm praying for you. And they've actually misspelled the word praying. They mean P-R-E-Y. And they don't mean I'm praying for you. They mean I'm praying on you. Discernment. Discernment for your friendship circle. There are some people who qualified to be friends until today. But where God is taking you, you need godly friends. You need friends who got the Holy Ghost. I can love people, but they don't have to be in my space. I need people in my space who hear God for themselves. Because this is a spiritual fight, ladies and gentlemen. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So I need people in my friendship circle who know how to go for on a fast, who know how to seek the Lord, who know how to pray. Guard your house. Stop letting anybody and everybody up in your house. Go home and anoint your house with oil and pray out evil spirits. Pray out confusion and chaos. Anoint the doorpost. Anoint the front door. Put a cross over your front door and say, in the name of Jesus, everything that's ungodly got to come out of this house. Open up the windows and let them out. Get out of here in the name. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Some of us need to go home and cast out witchcraft that's been lingering in our house. Demonic spirits lingering in your house. That's the reason why you wake up feeling funny and don't know why. It feels weird in here today because there's a spirit that's been camping out in your basement for far too long. But you can take oil home today and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I consecrate this house back to you. I dedicate this house back to you. And I command every demonic spirit to leave this house in the name of Jesus. This is a house of peace, a house of joy, a house of salvation. This is a Holy Ghost headquarters. No fighting, no confusion, no depression, no anxiety, no sin will come in this house. Somebody, that's all you need to hear today. Then the Bible says that Sam Ballot, Tobiah, the official, they heard of it. Watch this. They were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Some people can't stand the fact that other people love you so much. It got on their nerves. Why do you love them so much? Got on their nerves. Let me finish reading this verse 11. So I came to Jerusalem and I was there three days. Then I rose in the night. I and a few men with me. I told no one what God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Nor was there any animal with me except the one in which I rode. And I went out by the night through the valley gate to the serpent well uh, and the refuse gate and and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. Then I went out to the fountain gate and to the king's pool and there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. Verse 16. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. Let me say this before we leave. There comes a time where you got to learn how to keep what God spoke to you to yourself. And watch what Nehemiah is doing. He's evaluating what he has to get himself into, but he's not talking about it yet. He hasn't told anybody. See, some of us, we talk too much too soon. And you frustrated because people ask you, well, how are you going to do that? And you want to know why you don't have an answer yet? Because they're not even supposed to ask that question yet. You weren't supposed to tell them yet. But when you evaluate, God will give you all the hows. And then when that question comes, when it's time for you to talk and the question comes, you'll be better prepared to answer the question. He evaluates. He doesn't tell anybody. Why does he evaluate and not tell anybody? Because he wants to see what it entails for himself. Too many of us, many of us, we've been making decisions based on other people's testimonies because of what somebody say they saw, somebody say they heard. You made a decision that affected your life. And God says, make decisions based on stuff you see for yourself and do it quietly. And as you evaluate, here's three categories things fall into. What needs to be replaced? What needs to be restored? What needs to be restructured? And he, then he started telling people in verse 17, he said, 
You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of God, which had been upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said then, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to do this good work. Let me say this and I'm going to pray. After Nehemiah saw the land, he then went to the people. He said, let us rise up and let's build. And that's what I'm telling y'all today. I've seen the promised land. I've seen what God wants to do. I've seen where God is taking us. Dr. King in his last speech, he said, I may not get there with you. That ain't my speech today. My speech today is, and I'm going to get there with you. We're going to do this thing together. But I'm telling you in the words of Nehemiah, let us rise up and build the city. Let us rise up and build what God has called us to build. I'm telling you that God has shown me our destiny. He's shown me our purpose. He's shown me where we're going to land. And God says, tell my people today, as if you're talking from the mountaintop, tell them today, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to rise up and build the city for God. Just so I can know that I finished it. But when Sam Ballard, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us. They said, what is this thing you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? It's amazing how people try to put you on a guilt trip because they don't understand what God is doing in your life. They got the nerve to say they're rebelling against the king when they got permission from the king. Because the king where Nehemiah came from had written a letter, remember, to all of them. When God gives you permission, you do not need man's approval. Verse 20, and I'm done. So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself, <laughs> will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise. And, ooh, and I didn't even say it like this in the 9 a.m., but I am prophesying in the name of Jesus. In the words of Nehemiah, the God of heaven himself ooh, will prosper us. And we, his servants, will arise and build. And then he says, and we got the nerve to be entertaining conversations with people who don't even belong here. That's why he said, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. You don't even have a right to be here. Stop entertaining conversations with people who don't even deserve the privilege of your presence. Y'all, let's go home. It's late. I hope your reservations were at 3 o'clock. Everybody stand. Everybody stand. Woo! Man. I feel a rebirth in the kingdom of God. A rebirth in the kingdom of God. You are a special group of people. A called and chosen group of people. I see God's hand hovering over all of us saying, I got you. I got you. No service will be the same. The 9 a.m. was drastically different from the 11 a.m. No service from this day forward will ever be the same. Come expecting the unexpected. Come looking for miracles. Come looking out for a prophetic word that applies to your life. Gather your questions throughout the week, God says, because I'm going to answer them all on Sunday morning. And when we gather, it'll be the gathering of the champions, a gathering of the victorious people. Father, in the name of Jesus, take us from this place, but whatever you do, don't take us from your presence. Keep us and cover us and bring us back at the appointed time, ready to praise, worship, and honor you together. Thank you for speaking to us. These were not the words of Marlon Saunders. This was not a sermon by Marlon Saunders. Today we gathered in your presence 
and we heard the words of the Holy Spirit. We heard the words of our Father God who spoke from this platform throughout the building. So we don't give any credit to man. We give credit to God. Thank you for your spirit resting in this place. Go with us, be with us, continue to speak to us and through us. In Jesus' mighty name, somebody shout amen. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you. God bless you. I'll see you next Sunday at 11 a.m. 11 a.m. next Sunday. God bless you.